flows that bridge there yesterday, just a brief um, overview, is that we trace the story of the Ecclesia in the wilderness, which is a phrase that we find in Acts chapter 7 in Stephen's speech. And we drew some lessons from the Ecclesia in the wilderness, and we ended up yesterday by considering 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we left our considerations with seeing the victory that our Lord Jesus Christ had won over sin and over death. And this morning, brothers and sisters, we indeed come to remember our risen Lord in the emblems set before us. By way of presentation this morning, we would like to see how we have been brought to Christ through the things of the law. Now, I'm not going to be having an entire discourse on the law and all its various elements, but we will be seeing how we should be brought to Christ. And in doing so, we will see that the Ecclesia in the wilderness would have seen the outworking of the law every single day. Every day there was something that was required of them that they had to bring. And for us as the Ecclesia today, we ought to bring something to Christ every single day. Now let's go to Galatians chapter 3 that we just read with Brother uh, David. Galatians chapter 3 is when we find the, the phrase um, that the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And Galatians chapter 3, we know, that speaks about the covenant with Abraham. It speaks about the principle of the inheritance being by promise and not by law. And Paul makes the point that if righteousness could have come by the law, it would have. But it couldn't because the law highlighted sin. And in verse 22, we'll just pick up our consideration. It says, but the scripture had concluded all under sin, but the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So we sit here this morning, brothers and sisters, as those that have believed. We have believed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And yesterday we considered that glorious name of Yahweh. And Jesus is the name bearer of that name. And we have now been baptized into that name as we see from Galatians chapter 3. And then we see, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. So after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. We are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, neither male nor female, for you all one in Christ. If be Christ, then in the Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. We saw yesterday, brothers and sisters, that it's that promised time of rest that we all look to. And in the wilderness, Israel were on their way to the promised land. And things went wrong, so they spent 40 years in the wilderness. And we too are on the way to the promised land to, to gain our inheritance as seen in Abraham. But today we sit here as the ecclesia established under the new covenant. Paul writing here to Galatians tells us that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ so that we might be justified by faith. Now, the word for schoolmaster here in the Greek is the word pedagogue. And it's not in the, the schoolmaster analogy here is not in the traditional sense that we remember of going to school where with the teacher standing in front of the classroom uh, talking to board. Um, the word pedagogue here has the idea of an educated slave who took the child to school and stood beside the child during his lessons and was authorized to check and to chastise the child as necessary. So I concluded I should have had a pedagogue. Um, but it was it's interesting because it just highlights the fact that the law required that level of involvement, that every single check and balances should be kept. And so the law had this compulsion about it. But the law was, it was good, but the problem that we have seen so far is that no one could keep it. 
But after the faith has come, we no longer under that schoolmaster. We no un no longer under that regime, because God has revealed His perfection through the, His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, He kept the law, but He removed the curse of the law, as we see in Galatians chapter three, when He was nailed to the cross. And yesterday we saw the same analogy with the case of the serpents in the camp and that brass serpent put on the stake. Israel had to look to that serpent for salvation, that serpent of brass. And so the lesson is that anyone now can come to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no distinction. And in him, we see the attributes of God. And as we gather here every week, brothers and sisters, we are reminded of the perfection that is before us. You see, the law couldn't do that. Every single time Israel were involved with a sacrifice or an element of the law, they were reminded of sin. But here is the victory over sin. And we also see from Galatians chapter 3 that the, the covenant with Abraham, as we've already mentioned, is brought into sharp focus for us. Because in Christ, we are heirs of the promise. The same promise that the ecclesia in the wilderness was heirs of. But because of their stubbornness and their hard-heartedness, they never entered into the promised land. And we know that without them, we shouldn't be made perfect. So it's a complete picture. So everything is working according to God's plan. Come to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 has those lovely words of our Lord Jesus Christ. It speaks of he who was in the beginning and God's plan and purpose. Okay. And then let's just pick up the record in verse 9. That was the true light which was, that, that came, which lighted every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, or an account of him, and the world knew him not. He came to his, unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And John bear witness of him. This is he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And we see this morning, brothers and sisters, our Lord Jesus Christ as the word made flesh, as the glory of God. Jesus did no sin. He never came short of the glory of God. He was full of grace and truth. The true, real, and effective grace is seen through our Lord Jesus Christ. In a sense, we see the expression of grace here every single time that we come to remember our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the law was given by Moses. The law was given through Moses, and Moses was the channel by which the law was given to the people of Israel. But one of the main problems of the law was the law was external. It was an external thing. But when we come to the new covenant, and we see that grace and truth came by Jesus Christ is it because it was embodied in him. It was essentially who he was. And because of this, John draws the contrast here between law and grace. You see, of Moses, he was in the presence of God, in the cleft of the rock. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can see the face of the Father. You see, Jesus is in the bosom of the Father. There was no closer relationship revealed to us with God than the Son and the Father through the Scriptures. And so we see that with the law, there was this constant barrier that needed to be overcome. But when we come to Christ, we see that there is now fellowship and friendship with God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the... That's the beauty that we come to remember every single time. 
Now, one of the things that we sometimes, um, well, at least I don't think about, is how the Lord Jesus Christ saw himself in the record. Because it must have been quite surreal to understand that you were the subject of everything that the law spoke of, what the prophets spoke of, and everything pointed forward to you. Come to Luke chapter 24, because there's a lovely little interlude after his resurrection on the road to Emmaus, where our risen and victorious Lord speaks to the two on the road to Emmaus. And we know the, the story that the resurrection had happened, and these two were full of consternation as to where the Lord was. And one of them is clear pass, and they are on this road, and Jesus joins them and starts talking to them. And he says to them in verse 25, Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. And they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it, and brake it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And it would be absolutely fascinating, brothers and sisters, to have recorded for us what exactly the Lord Jesus Christ spoke of when he began at Moses and all the prophets. And there was a pivotal moment in this account here when he breaks bread with them. You see, it's, it's, a, it's the honor of kings, brothers and sisters, to search out a matter. And I believe that in this discourse, the Lord Jesus Christ ended up speaking to them about him being the bread of life because he broke bread with them, because their eyes were opened because they didn't know him. Was it not that he taught them, as we saw from 1 Corinthians yesterday, that he was the spiritual meat, the true manna that came from above? And he was the true drink indeed. He was the water of life that flowed from the rock. And notice here, brothers and sisters, that he only breaks bread with him because he will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the bride is complete. So there's a little cameo here, brothers and sisters, that I think with him beginning at Moses and the prophets, that he could unlock to these two an understanding of who he really was as the son of God, as the bread of life, and as the spiritual drink. Come to John chapter 6. You see, in John chapter 6, the Lord Jesus Christ op further opens our understanding on the subject of bread. He says in verse 27, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. And then they said unto him, What shall we do? that we might work the works of God. Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God, that he believe on him whom he hath sent. There's the faith of Galatians chapter 3 that's required, that we believe on him. And they said unto him, therefore unto him, what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. And the lesson from the Lord Jesus Christ here is, brothers and sisters, that under the law they perished. The bread of the law couldn't give life. It was only when the true bread from heaven came, that, and that was who he was, that life could come. And then in verse 35, and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. 
where is the spiritual meat and the spiritual drink of First Corinthians chapter 10? And that's what we come to remember this morning, brothers and sisters. You see, Israel, under the law, continually hungered and they continually thirsted. But not so for us, because we have the privilege of being in the new covenant. And then in verse 48, he says, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. No doubt as to what the bread of life is about. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread which I give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Verse 50, uh, 54, Whoso, sorry, verse 53, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. What wonderful language that our Lord Jesus Christ is using here, brothers and sisters, that we will be raised in the last day, that we are seen to be together with him now. From 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we saw yesterday that we participate in his victory, that he won over sin and death every single time we participate in the breaking of bread and in the drinking of wine. And it's, it's very interesting, brothers and sisters, to, to really contemplate that and see what that means for us. And added to this is our understanding, brothers and sisters, that the Lord Jesus Christ was the rock of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and he was the rock of the wilderness. You see, all these things that we consider are very firmly based on, on a very solid foundation. We know that in Scripture, God is effectively the rock. In Psalm 78 that we considered yesterday, they remembered that God was their rock and the high God their redeemer. And so we remember too that God is our rock. But in the story of Moses and the children of Israel and the water coming forth from the rock, we see that the Lord Jesus Christ is that rock. He becomes the manifestation of his father. So when we eat bread and we drink wine, we go back to that point and we remember the living waters that flow from him. And when we come to the story of the rock in Exodus 17 and Numbers 20, we remember that Moses was asked to strike the rock in Exodus 17 and he was asked to speak to the rock in Numbers 20. And then in Numbers 20, in anger, he smote the rock twice. You see, Moses had committed an awful transgression. The rock of the ages, being the Lord Jesus Christ, was to be smitten only once. It is appointed unto men once to die. And Christ was offered once for the sins of many. And Moses had broken the pattern. And the story of the rock in the wilderness is a beautiful story of God and the Lord Jesus Christ working together for salvation. And Isaiah says to us, So everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye to buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. So here is the things, brothers and sisters, that we can, can participate of freely and willingly with our price. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ was that willing sacrifice. Now, unfortunately, in the story of the exodus of the ecclesia in the wilderness, the event of Moses striking the rock would prevent him from leading Israel into the promised land. And all he could do was look from the top of the mountain towards where the land would be. 
And Moses, we read, died, his eyes not being dim and his natural forces not being abated. He died as the mediator of the old covenant. And in his death, brothers and sisters, Moses graphically showed that the law could not give life. It would require the Lord Jesus Christ to come, the greater than Moses, who would come and who would be obedient in all things because he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And so we see that the Lord Jesus Christ achieved what the law could not. And Jesus would become the rock, the chief cornerstone on which the ecclesia would be built. The ecclesia in the wilderness, brothers and sisters, wandered on sand. But we have a permanent resting place. Every time the Israelites moved, they had to dismantle, pull down, pack up the tabernacle, pack up their tents, and move. But here, we have a permanent foundation, and we build their own. And that's the lesson of Hebrews chapter 9 and Hebrews chapter 10, that the Lord Jesus Christ has achieved these things through his sacrifice. And let's just pick up one or two ideas from Hebrews chapter 9. He says in verse 11 of chapter 9, But Christ being come, and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. And therein is the beauty of the new covenant, brothers and sisters. No longer required to bring a daily sacrifice in its physical form. We are now renewed in the spirit of our mind every day. But the ritual that the law required is no longer there. And yesterday we spoke briefly about the tabernacle, and unfortunately the video didn't work. And we alluded to the fact that in the tabernacle, everything spoke about the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Hebrews chapter 10, we have those wonderful words that the writer uses in verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Boldness means confidence. We have confidence in what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. And so we can enter into the most holy by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh and having an high priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession, profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke and to love and to good works. And so that's what we have done this weekend, brothers and sisters. We've provoked each other to love and to good works. But in verse 19, as we look as to what is really happening by entering into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, we see, brothers and sisters, this morning, as we partake of the bread and wine, that we have that spiritual meat and that spiritual drink before us. And because we are partakers of the spiritual meat and the spiritual drink, we may with boldness enter into the holiest by Jesus. And as we do so, we have walked past the brazen altar. And we realize that our Lord was the perfect sacrifice who only had to offer himself once. We walk past the labor and we understand that we've been washed clean because of him, because he is the living water. He is the rock from whence the water came forth. And as we enter the holy place, we go through the door and we see that the Lord Jesus Christ is the door through which we must enter. We see the golden lampstand giving light and we see Jesus as the light of the world. We see the table of showbread and we see that fellowship is now possible with the Father and the Son, because Jesus was the bread of life. We walk up to the altar of incense, and our prayers of appreciation and thankfulness rise to the Father, through him our mediator of the new covenant. 
And then we lift our eyes, brothers and sisters, to the veil. And we see that it's rent in two. The way is open to the most holy because of our Lord. And then we enter the most holy, not in our own confidence, but in the confidence knowing that our Lord overcame and has won the victory. And we see the blood-spattered mercy seat. We see gold and the lesson of tried faith. We see the rod that budded as our Lord Jesus Christ rose to life. We see him as the victor as we gaze on the Ten Commandments, for he was the only one to have ever kept them. Then our eyes rest on the manna, angels' food, and we see him as the bread of heaven. And so we see our Lord Jesus Christ now, brothers and sisters, as victorious over sin and death, having overcome. And we see this morning that the bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? In the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? And may it be, brothers and sisters, that the time to eat and drink anew with him may indeed come.